Assalamu alaikum all, welcome back to my channel. I pray that you are all in the best of health and iman. If you are new, welcome. My name is Nafisa. I am a Muslim life coach. I support Muslim women with relationship and mental health issues. So if you're interested in being coached in those areas, you can find me over on my website, which I will leave linked in the description box down below. But over here on YouTube, I make Islamic lifestyle as well as Dawah content. So if you're interested in that, then definitely make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. So guys, I hope you had a lovely Eid. Alhamdulillah, I did. And I hope you guys are fasting the six days of Shawwal. For me, I am not because I'm prioritizing paying off my debt because I don't know if I'm going to live to see tomorrow. And that is something that I owe to Allah. I would hate to meet Allah and feel like... I owe him parts of my Ramadan. So I'm prioritizing um, completing my days of Ramadan. Anyways, today's video is on narcissism and we're going to be discussing what it is and how, what kind of characteristics can we spot in narcissistic Muslim men in particular. So without any further ado, guys, let's jump straight into the video. So the word narcissism has been thrown out there quite loosely nowadays, but I just want to make a distinction. There is narcissistic personality disorder, and then there are people who have characters, character traits of individuals with narcissistic personality disorder, okay? So there is a difference between the two. One is an actual personality disorder that psychologists actually classify people as being under, and the other one is just having some of the character traits. I just wanted to make clear some of the character traits that you will generally find in an individual who may be narcissistic. Number one, an exaggerated sense of self-importance. They think that they are a gift to the rest of the world. Number two, the need for constant and excessive admiration. They're basically attention seekers. Number three, they expect to be recognized as superior to others. Number four, they take advantage of others to get what they want. Number five, they may have an unwillingness to recognize the needs or feelings of others. Number six, they can be arrogant and pretentious, meaning they can be quite fake. As long as it serves them and whatever they need to get from someone else, they'll do what it takes. Number seven, they can be quite competitive. And this is not being competitive for the sake of wanting to do well, is being competitive because they want to be at the very top because they need to be admired. They have that need to be the most important person in the room. Number eight, they can often belittle others and look down on others. This is where a lot of the criticisms will come from. They will criticize their spouse, criticize their family members. No one can ever do enough to please them, so on and so forth. Number nine, they can sometimes fantasize about success, having power, being brilliant, so on and so forth. Number 10, they expect favors and compliance from others. Compliance is basically doing as you're told. They expect to tell someone to do whatever they want them to do and they expect the instructions to be followed without any questions. Number 11, they are also usually compulsive liars and a compulsive liar is someone that lies consistently. It's not even just like once in a while, it's just most things, it's a lie. They are also very manipulative and they often gaslight individuals. And gaslighting is all about making someone question themselves. So it's like, I just saw you walk into that shop and you just stole something. They're like, I didn't steal anything. Like, what are you talking about? You're crazy, you're seeing things in your head. So they stand up for their lie so strongly that you start to question yourself. You start to think, wait, am I the crazy one? Did I, did I not just see them just walk into that store and steal that thing? What, what do you mean? Like, and they will absolutely deny it with such conviction. That is an example of gaslighting. When someone makes you question the reality of what you know to be true, that right there is gaslighting. And narcissists are expert gaslighters, expert at this thing. 
they will make you question yourself to where you start to think you're the crazy one. So unfortunately, this is just some of the examples of the characteristics that you might identify in someone who is narcissistic. Now we're going to look at narcissistic Muslim men in particular. What are some of the things that they tend to do? And how do I know this? Unfortunately, I have come across a few in my life. It is not pleasant, I'll tell you that. Also, my coaching experience, as well as the fact that my degree is in psychology and so narcissism is something that I've studied as well. So I have my job, I have my studies and I have my personal life experiences and I've put all of that together to come up with this list to share with you sisters so that you can be careful. The next point that I want to make is in relation to the type of person that this individual might be. Narcissists, as I've mentioned at the beginning of the video, have this sense of self-importance and they want to be known and seen. They love to be admired. They absolutely love to be admired. And so unfortunately, these narcissistic Muslim men could be your sheikhs, they could be your imams, they could be your Quran teachers, they could be that brother that's always doing dawah all over the place, alhamdulillah for the deen, but again what? You have to look for the character. Because sometimes these positions, they take on these characters and they take on these positions because it makes them feel like they are important. It makes them feel like, yeah, I'm somebody, you know, I'm known, everybody knows me. You know, everybody knows me. Have you ever met that one person who just feels like, oh, I've got so many options of sisters to marry because, you know, everybody knows me and, you know, I'm in a position of this, that and the other. Like, no one cares about your position. We care about who you are as a person. So sisters, be mindful that just because he's an imam, just because he's a sheikh, just because he studied in Saudi Arabia doesn't mean that he cannot be a narcissist. OK, so look for the dean, but be very mindful of the character as well because a lot of these narcissistic men also hold high positions in society. One of the things that a narcissistic Muslim man will tend to do is that he will tend to look for women who are vulnerable. Now what are some of the things that can make a woman vulnerable to a narcissistic man? Number one, if you are a people pleaser. Oh if you are a people pleaser it's game over for you. Because a narcissist needs to be constantly admired. He needs to be the center of attention. The entire world needs to be about him and your whole world needs to surround him. And so he's looking for a woman who is people pleasing so that she will spend all of her life trying to please him. And I'm going to touch up on another point later on and I'll use this example again. But that's one of the things that a narcissistic Muslim man is looking for, is a woman who is a people pleaser. The second thing that can make you vulnerable to a narcissistic man is having an empathic personality. Now, being empathic is something that is encouraged within the deen. We're always encouraged to think about other people, put other people before us, give to charity, make dua for others. It's always about serving others in order to please Allah. However, Anything that goes to the extreme can be bad. And so there are some sides of an empathic individual that makes them attractive to a narcissistic individual. So if you are an empath out there, you need to work hard on yourself. You need to work hard on, on having boundaries. You need to work hard on not being, not being a people pleaser. You need to work hard on not, on not being too afraid of confrontation. Okay, because you need some of those boundaries to protect yourself from people like narcissists because they are looking for someone like that to marry. So that can make you vulnerable. Another thing that can make you vulnerable as a Muslim woman to a narcissistic Muslim man is if you do not know enough about your religion. Oh, sister, you are in trouble. If you don't know enough about your religion, he is going to use quotations from the Quran, he is going to use hadith, anything that he can to manipulate your mind and make you feel so small, make you feel so low, that you will even question your relationship with your Lord. You will question whether or not you're a good enough person. These individuals are toxic people. Narcissists are not healthy individuals. They might have a side to them that is healthy, but in general, they are toxic people. 
Sadly, there are people who say, Ashadu Allahi ilaha illallah, Ashadu Anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, but they are still toxic, which is why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying weighs so heavily, even more so nowadays. And when he says that, when a man comes to seek your daughter's hand in marriage, you must look for two things. You must look at his deen and you must look at his character. And all of these things about narcissism is all to do with character and personality traits. Those two things you must be satisfied with before you hand your daughter over to that man. If you don't do that, you're going to be in trouble. And so sisters, these topics are very important for us as Muslims to discuss. The next thing that can make a Muslim woman vulnerable to narcissistic Muslim men is that if she is coming from a family background where she's not very close with her family. Sisters, it is very important. Try your best to maintain a relationship with your family, with your close relatives. So your parents, it is, it's a no-brainer. You have to have that relationship with your parents. Very important. Whether they are your biological parents or whether they are just parents who've raised you. You really need that. Because a narcissistic Muslim man, when he sees that you don't have anyone backing you up, oh, you are just the perfect candidate. Because now he can do whatever he wants to you because he knows that no one's going to question him. And I always say, a man that is not accountable to anyone is a dangerous man. Every man needs someone that he is accountable to. You need to know that in that man's life, he has someone that when he goes wrong or when he needs to be advised, he has someone that he respects well enough who can give him counsel, who can give him advice. Especially with the young men nowadays. They think they know everything, but they don't. We're all in that boat. We think we know it all, but we actually don't. I have elders in my life, people who I love and respect, who I know that I can go to for counsel. And even when I don't go to them for counsel, I let them hold me accountable. If I'm doing something wrong, I'm like, please, like, feel free to correct me. I'm not above correction. And anyone who feels that they are above correction, if you marry that type of a man, you might be in trouble because the truth of the matter is he's not always going to get things right. So sometimes these narcissistic Muslim men look for women who don't have a supportive family background so that he is the only supportive family that you have and so when he starts to abuse you, he knows that nobody's going to come and hold him accountable for that. The next thing that I've noticed is very popular amongst the narcissistic Muslim men is the manipulations of some of the ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to control a woman. And what I'm speaking about here is the hadith in which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that if a Muslim woman who is a wife obey, um, prays her five daily prayers, fasts in the month of Ramadan and obeys her husband, she can enter Jannah from any um, door that she wishes. So, knowing this, the man or the narcissistic Muslim husband thinks, well, the most important thing for her is to attain Jannah. So, if she doesn't do absolutely everything that I say, if whenever I abuse her, she doesn't keep quiet and take my abuse and allow me to abuse her, then I'm not going to be happy with her. And so by me not being happy with her, that means I'm robbing her of, of her ability to attain Jannah. And so they love using that. I know that every man here and there, every husband here and there might just spring up that hadith in order to just joke with his wife. But I'm talking about men who do this consistently and men who act upon this. So every time he does something that is wrong and you happen to just speak up, or you happen to correct him, now is, and I'm not even happy with you, I'm going to bed, I'm not going to be happy with you, why, so that the angels can curse you, I'm going to bed and I'm not happy with you, so why, so that you, you're not going to attain Jannah, basically, so what they're trying to do is to show you their position, and to make you feel like they have the say about whether or not you attain Jannah, on that note, sisters, I want to make one thing very, very clear, and again, this goes back to knowing your deen, the husband is not the one that decides whether you will attain Jannah or not. That's first and foremost. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that decides whether you attain Jannah or not. This ahadith has conditions. The condition being that 
your husband is on the, upon the truth and he is doing the right thing. So whenever your husband is not doing the right thing and you're able to call him and sit down and you're able to kindly advise him and give him counsel, but as a narcissist, they don't take advice very well. Every advice is an insult, by the way. It doesn't matter if you do it nicely or you do it harshly. Anything that comes across as you mentioning something negative about them is an insult. You have to know that the decision does not belong to them. The decision of you going to Jannah does not belong to them. The decision belongs to Allah. If you feel like your husband is doing the wrong thing, you're not meant to sit there and support him, okay? There is no obedience to mankind if it means disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? If you are a good sister, you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've always tried to support your husband in the way of good, and then one day he does something that's not right, you don't support him, he becomes angry, and if he thinks that on the day of judgment, he's going to stand before Allah and say, Allah, I'm not happy with my wife, and he thinks that because he feels that way, Allah's gonna put you to hell, Sis, you've got nothing to worry about. That's not what the hadith means. Number three thing that narcissistic men, again, consistently do. I'm not saying if your husband does this one time or he's done this twice, then suddenly he's a narcissist. I'm saying a narcissistic Muslim man consistently does this thing. And that is to always bring up the topic of taking another wife. I know, sisters are like, thank you, Nafisa, for mentioning this. You're welcome. This again is an attempt to control a woman, to make her feel like, look, if you don't do everything I want you to do, I will just go out there and I will just marry another wife. I will just take wife number two and I will just take wife number three and I will just take wife number four. And this is not just a one-off thing like he's joking with you. This is constant everyday reminder. That is done to make you feel small, to make you feel insecure, like you're not good enough. And a lot of sisters fall for this one, okay? A lot of sisters fall for this one. You start panicking, you start thinking, oh my God, well, I have to do everything to please him. Listen, do the best that you can for the sake of Allah. Marriage is an ibadah. It's an ibadah, okay? To so do the best that you can for the sake of Allah. The rest of it, leave it alone, sis leave it alone if he wants to go and take wife number two three and four that is his problem but don't make it your problem as long as you know that you are doing the best for the sake of allah alhamdulillah okay so be mindful if a man is consistently always always bringing up these things if you're not yet married to him and you're just in the talking phase and he's always mentioning and and always talking about you know, making reference to the fact that, well, if a woman doesn't do this for me, then I'll go take wife number two, then I'll go take wife number three. Listen, just, just have it as a red flag in your mind and be mindful and look for the other signs because he might, he may well be a narcissist. The next thing I'm going to say links in with the fact that narcissists tend to have an unwillingness to feel for others, an unwillingness to recognize other people's feelings and how things might be affecting people negatively. So this is to do with the fact that a narcissistic Muslim man might constantly remind you that if you don't fulfill his needs when he needs it and when he wants it, then the angels will curse you until the morning. And this is for the wives. A narcissistic man will not understand. A narcissistic man is going to get angry. He probably won't speak to you for the next one week just because you were not able to fulfill that need that one time. If you're just refusing your husband every day because you can't be bothered, sis, you need to fix up because that also is not good. But if you know that for the most part, whenever your husband needs you, you're there for him and you fulfill his needs in that way, and it's just the once in a while that you're not able to, if he can't even understand that, if he doesn't feel sorry enough for you to know that, you know what, my wife is very tired, let me give her a break for tonight, he might not be very happy about it. But again, you and him can reach a compromise. Maybe you can sleep for a few hours and then fulfill his needs. Maybe the next day you fulfill his needs, right? So if he can't, if he can't reason with you and absolutely every single time he wants it, regardless of, the emotional state or the physical state that you're in, irregardless of that, he still wants you to fulfill his needs. 
that might just be one of the signs, okay? I'm not saying it makes him a narcissist. I'm saying it's just one of the signs. And that is something that you need to sit him down and you need to discuss with him because narcissistic Muslim men are very good at every single time they want it, they need to have it right away, irregardless of what's happening with you. And that is not healthy. The reality of marriage the reality of life is that there's going to be times between a husband and a wife where either of them are going to need each other but they might not be able to fulfill the needs of each other either because one person is sick or one person is not well but they're able to reach a nice compromise the fourth thing that i've noticed that muslim narcissistic husbands tend to do is that they try their best to keep their wives away from their families so what I mean here is that the man discourages his wife from having a relationship with her own family members. So he hates for her to go visit her parents, He does not like her speaking to her mom too much on the phone or her dad or her siblings. And I think this all comes down again to having that full sense of control over her and making sure that no one else is putting anything into her head that is in opposition of what he wants her to believe. And again, a healthy man loves for you to have a con connection with your parents because he understands the value of family. He understands that you have your relationship with him, but you also have a relationship with your family. And that's something that can't be cut. And this is just a reminder also to say that sisters, whether you are married or not, it is not allowed in Islam to cut family ties. So you have to maintain a relationship with your parents. At the end of the day, they are your blood. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, as with lots of marriages nowadays that don't work out, when it doesn't work out, who do you go back to? You go back to your family. So please, I understand your responsibility in marriage. I understand that your husband is now a priority in your life. But that is no excuse to abandon your family. And any man who's trying to discourage you from having a relationship with your family, you really need to sit down and have this discussion with him. Let him know how important it is for you to maintain a relationship with your family. Please, sisters, do not abandon your families because you've gotten married. It's not a good enough excuse, okay? You need your family to be there for you in case of anything, all right? So be mindful of men who try to keep you away from your, from your family because you have to ask yourself the question, what is the agenda behind him keeping me away from my family? Whether he thinks your mom is a good person or not, it doesn't take away from the fact that she's still your mom and he cannot stop you from speaking to your mom or going to see your mom. So please make sure you prioritize your family and give your family their own rights as well as also making sure that you give your husband his own right as well. The fifth thing that I've noticed that some Muslim men with narcissistic traits tend to do is that they make the wife promise or their wives to be promise never ever to share any of their marital issues with anybody. And although for the most part, most people love to keep their marital issues between themselves. And to some extent, I do also advise this because I think sometimes a husband and wife, they can fall out. And if the husband always goes and talks badly about his wife to other people outside, or the wife always goes and speaks badly about, um, about her husband to other people outside, whenever they come together and they make up, which for the most part tends to happen in marriages, husband and wives, they fall apart and then they make up again. When they make up again, the people on the outside have not forgotten what has happened. And the people on the outside are looking at both couples thinking, what, what was going on? But he just did X, Y, and Z to you. And he and she just did X, Y, and Z to you. And because there isn't that mawadda and rahmah in the hearts of the people on the outside, they don't understand how the, the couples have managed to come back together, irregardless of the issues that they've been through. And so because of that, I think for the most part, don't go out there and start talking about all your marital issues with people on the outside. However, having said that, my opinion is that it is healthy to have someone who fulfills these certain conditions. Number one, they are also a Muslim and they are a practicing Muslim. They have wisdom. 
they are an individual with wisdom and they are an individual that can keep their mouth shut <laughs> when necessary because we all know of a partic particular somebody they're old enough so we assume that they are wise but they're not wise and they also don't know how to keep quiet so you take your marital issues to them and then they pick up the phone and broadcast all of your marital problems to everybody else on the outside without helping you or giving you any solutions. That's not the kind of person you need to look for. I know it is difficult for couples to find someone that fulfills all these three conditions. They are a God-fearing person that follows the deen properly. They are, have wisdom and they are also someone who can keep things to themselves. But if you can find someone who fulfills those conditions, I highly recommend having someone between the two of you who is that person because sometimes you are just going to fall out. It's unthinkable to think you're going to be in marriage for 20, 30 years and you're never going to get to a point where you and your husband are clashing. It's unrealistic. You're going to fall out with your husband. There's going to be times your husband is going to be speaking to you and you just won't hear it. You won't hear it. You won't be able to understand him. It's nice for him to have someone that he knows that he can go to and say, you know, my wife and I are having these issues. This is what I've, uh, tried, to, I've tried to speak to her, but she really doesn't understand me. Can you help? Maybe you can explain it in a way to her that she might be more receptive of. Or maybe my husband, you know, we've been clashing over this issue. I know that he respects you. Maybe you can speak to him and maybe he'll understand and maybe it will help to bring us closer together. Okay, so you need somebody like that. So having someone like that is very healthy for a marriage. But a narcissistic man does not even want to hear about it. A healthy man, if he is of the opinion that he doesn't want anyone to know about any issues in his marriage, when you say something like this to him, and the both of you are able to find someone like this, he will be happy for it because he also understands that sometimes he might speak to you and you might not be able to understand. And he also knows that he's not perfect. And sometimes he might make mistakes and it will be good to have someone who wants the best for the both of you intervene and help to bring you both together. That's what a, a healthy man will be okay with that as long as those conditions are met. But an unhealthy narcissistic man is not going to have it. Anything that you say outside of your marriage to anybody be it your parents, it can even be his own parents. He doesn't care. Anything that you say outside of the marriage is going to be a problem. Again, because he does not want anyone knowing where he's going wrong. And most of us don't want people knowing where we're going wrong. But it gets to a point where if it's really badly affecting the relationship, someone needs to speak to him. And it, again, it goes back to that point that I made earlier about if a man has no one that he is accountable to he is a dangerous man especially if he's not practice practicing his dean properly those of us who are young right here we need all the help we can get so please try to have someone who can counsel the both of you in times when you're both going wrong and if a man says he doesn't want to hear it just have that red flag in your mind it's not enough to say just because he doesn't want that one thing he's a narcissist no but again it's just something to be mindful of when you hear that, I want everything in our marriage to be a secret, start looking for the other signs because he might have a lot of narcissistic traits. The final character trait I've noticed in Muslim men who have a lot of narcissistic um, character traits is that they are very short-tempered people. And not only are they short-tempered people, but they also don't have a lot of control over their temper. So these men tend to be the type of men who also practice domestic abuse. And so sister, whether you are married or not, if a man is domestically abusing you, go and find help and find your way out. I'm sorry. Find your way out of that situation. That is not healthy. He's not going to stop. You're going to spend all of your life trying to please this person who couldn't care less about your physical health, let alone your mental health. And a lot of the time, a man who has such little control over his anger that he's willing to raise his hands and hit, hit another person, especially a woman, is a weak man. And by the time he's able to do that, he or, he's most likely already presented a majority of these character traits that I have mentioned. So be mindful of a man who has a bad temper, such a bad temper that he cannot control it sisters be very mindful of that because at the end of the day you're going to have to live with this person 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and I from such trials because these individuals are they are just a test okay the sad truth about this is that people with narcissistic personality dis disorder find it very difficult to change those with the character traits might change depends on how you know how far they've gone up the scale they might change but for the most part they tend not to change so the best thing is if a man approaches you for marriage and he is showing a lot of these signs, sis, just run for your life. That's the best advice I can give you. Just run for your life. If he's got six or seven of these things I've spoken about, just run for your life, please. You will thank me later. Even if you like him, because life with him will be miserable because they don't change, unfortunately. So having said all of this, what can, what can someone who's already in that situation do to help themselves? That is another video in and of itself. And if you want me to make a video suggesting ways that you can manage if you're already married to a narcissistic Muslim husband, then please leave a comment in the comment section down below for me and let me know. And those of you who agree, make sure you like that comment so that I see that a lot of people want that content. And inshallah, I'll be able to do that for you. Inshallah, I also plan to create another video speaking about narcissistic Muslim mothers because unfortunately, oh dear, there are a lot of these in the Muslim community. So inshallah, the next um, video on the topic of relationship that I make will be about narcissistic Muslim mothers. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and you've, I hope you've learned a thing or two or you've been reminded of a thing or two, okay? Or at least now you know what to be careful of and what to look for if a spouse, uh, a man comes and proposes to you, some of the things to be careful of in terms of his character. So if you have enjoyed this video, guys, please make sure you give it a thumbs up. Share it with any sister out there who you feel will benefit from today's content. OK, awareness is the best thing we can do for, for, for each other in terms of protecting one another. As they say, prevention is better than cure. So Jazakallah, hey guys, for watching this video. And inshallah, ta'ala, I will see you guys in my next one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.